Johnny Dollar. Mr. Dollar, this is Frederick Benham. Benham? That's right, a Tri-Mutual Insurance Company Limited. Oh, I see. There's a very important matter I'd like you to look into for us. I thought you always used members of your own staff. I mean, as investigators. Ordinarily, we do, Mr. Dollar. Ordinarily, any problem that might arise would be handled by one of our own men. In this case, however, unfortunately, not one of them is a fisherman. Did you say fisherman? That's right. I understand from those reports of yours that are broadcast on the radio that you are um, a very good one. Well, I like to think so, but do you mind telling me what connection that can possibly have with an insurance problem? I would be very glad to. Uh, shall we say at 3.30 this afternoon, here in my office? Well, if it has anything whatever to do with fishing, Mr. Benham. Oh, it has, Mr. Dollar. It has. 3.30, then? Okay. I'll be there. <laughs> CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Tri-Mutual Insurance Company Limited Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the low tide matter. Why kid about it? Tri Mutual is not a company I'd ever pick to work for. Although I'm sure they serve their clients very well, they just happen to be a notoriously stingy outfit when it comes to handing out money for assigned services. But it's the old story. Mention that magical word fishing and I'm gone. Expense account item one. At exactly 3.15 p.m., $1.20 for a cab to Mr. Benham's office in the Tri-Mutual building. Being the methodical sort that he is, he kept me waiting at the reception desk until the exact time of our appointment. Very well, well, Mr. Dollar. You may come in now. I was beginning to think you'd forgotten I was waiting out here. Our uh, date was for 3.30, I believe. And then you're slipping, Mr. Benham. Slipping? Mm -hmm. According to my watch, it's nearly 3.31. Then your watch must be wrong. But come in, please. All right. Now, let's get one thing straight. Yeah? I'm freelance. That means you pay my expense account on whatever it is you want me to do. I'm fully aware of that. Also, I'll expect a fee. I'm quite familiar with your scale of fees, Mr. Dollar. Or, of course, a commission. A percentage of the actual amount of insurance involved. Of the amount saved, Mr. Dollar. <laughs> All right, have it your way. I usually do. I'm sure you do. But whichever comes out largest, fee or commission, that's what I get. Okay? Yes, 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 yes. But, uh, now sit down. All right. I wouldn't want you to start charging us for the time taken with these, um, shall we say, amenities. What's it all about? The Foster Machine Tool Company, or rather, Mr. Charles Foster himself and his junior partner, Michael Brady. They're both clients of yours? Our concern is over a partnership policy we've written for them that will pay the survivor some $500,000 if and when the other dies. That's a lot of money. Which of them is on the sick list? Neither. But I'm seriously worried about Charles Foster. How come? He came in here the other day to ask if the policy could be canceled. I see. And of course, I had to tell him we couldn't do that without the permission of young Brady. Mm -hmm. Why does he want to cancel? He and Brady haven't been getting along. Business hasn't been good, and he suspects Brady, who is much younger and completely and selfishly ambitious of being responsible. Why, when Brady himself has a share in it? To ruin Foster, force him to sell out his share of the business cheap. Oh, it's been done before, I guess. Of course it has. But then Brady walked in and said he wouldn't consider cancellation of the policy for a minute. So the only trouble with Foster was that he was overworked. But what he needed was some rest and relaxation. Don't we all? I beg your pardon. No, nothing, nothing. Go on, Mr. Benham. I've tried to reach them for several days now in the hope of talking it out with them. Well, uh of helping them reach some amicable solution to their problem. They've refused to see him? No, not exactly. They've gone away together. Where? On a fishing trip. Look, don't knock it. It's the best way in the world I know of to get rid of troubles. Best way in the world I know of for Brady to get rid of Charles Foster. Oh, no, wait a And minute. thereby collect half a million dollars insurance. Mr. Benham, aren't you jumping to conclusions just because a couple of men... You go... wait a minute, Dollar. 
You don't know these two as well as I do. I don't know them at all, but it does seem to me Perhaps that... Perhaps Foster is getting old. Perhaps Brady is right in wanting that business for himself. He'd certainly make a go of it. Then what's the beef? Well, the more I think of it, the more certain I am that Brady knows only too well that the one way to get that business without its costing him anything, and a half a million besides, is by having Foster dead. For old Foster to go on a fishing trip. Ridiculous. What's the matter with a fishing trip? Nothing for you or me or Brady, but for old Charles Foster. Ridiculous. Yes, you said that. And when Brady wouldn't inform me or Foster's wife or anyone else where he was taking him. Well, Dolly, you've just got to find them. Make sure that Foster gets back here safe. Now, Mr. Benham. Or if it's too late, that Brady has already done him in. That Brady is brought to justice. Well, you sure can build a mountain out of a molehill. And I tell you that if you knew those men as well as I do, Dollar, you've got to find them. And uh, don't forget there's a possibility of a commission on a half a million dollars. Yes, but not much probability. I think you're going off half-cocked. Would you rather not take on this potentially highly lucrative assignment? Okay, as long as you're paying the bill, I'll go out and look for them. Good. Now, what's your first move? Well, you know something, Mr. Benham? Yes. I haven't the vaguest idea. If you ever suffer a touch of arthritis or rheumatism and you've never tried mentholatum deep heating rub, you can't know how good its deep heating action can make you feel. As you massage it into painful areas, you feel its deep heating action. You know relief is on its way. Mentholatum Deep Heating Rub is an extra strong combination of active ingredients for safe, temporary relief of minor arthritic, rheumatic pain. Use greaseless, stainless Mentholatum Deep Heating Rub often. My first move was to call on Mrs. Charles Foster, a sweet, lovely little lady in her 60s. She was worried sick over the way her husband had suddenly taken off for parts unknown with young Michael Brady. She didn't trust Brady. She was afraid of him, of what he might do to get his hands on the business. By the time she got through talking, I began to wonder if maybe Fred Benham's fears weren't justified after all. Then I called on Mrs. Mike Brady. This was something else again. Kathy Brady was a living doll, and not one bit worried about the way her husband had taken off. Why should she be? This girl had everything. I mean, besides looks and charm and all that goes with. He'd set her up in a home that must have cost a couple of hundred grand with a couple of expensive cars, clothing, jewelry, the whole bit. Whether business was bad or not, they were living high on the hog, no doubt of it. And while Mike's away, Johnny, I'm having a ball. A flock of big parties that are really the most... Well, I don't doubt it, Mrs. Brady, but oh, now what I... Oh, please, Johnny, call me Kathy. Hmm? Okay, now, Kathy... And if you're on the loose, I mean, if you'd like to be included in on some of these brawls... I'm afraid that I have a job to do. I have to find your husband. And I would certainly appreciate you giving me any ideas of where I could start. Oh, now look, honey, don't worry about Mike. He'll be back. He always comes back. He kind of likes me. You said always? Well, you don't think this is the first time he's just up and gone fishing or something? Well, where does he go? Oh, I don't know. Somewhere as far away from business as he can get. When we lived on the West Coast, he'd go up to Lake Mead or Mojave... Sometimes he even came east to Maine, New Hampshire. So, now, who knows? Tell me one thing, Kathy. Anything, Johnny. Um, did he usually take somebody along with him on his trips? Oh, now I get it. What? It's that old Mr. Foster, his partner, that you're worried about. Now, surely you don't think a thing like that could ever happen again. A thing like what, Kathy? I mean like that partner he had a few years ago when they went on a hunting trip to Canada and some fool with a big rifle almost killed Michael, too. The man who was then his partner was killed? Oh, poor Michael. He was so upset about it, he sold out the business. And you know, it still upsets him if I even so much as mention it to him or anybody else. But now about these parties I'm throwing while he's away, Johnny... Kathy, Kathy, you're sure you don't know where they might have gone? I haven't the least idea, Johnny. Mm -hmm. But now listen, if you're free and like a lot of fun... I'm sorry, but I, I really have to go now. Oh, where to, Johnny? A long, long way from here. 
Sure, Mike Brady could use a half a million bucks. Living it up the way they obviously did. And what a plum that machine tool business would be if, that is, he didn't have to share it with an old man. And what about his former partner? Hunting accident? Oh, bet. But where to start? I took a cab back to my apartment. That's item three, a buck and a half. Poured myself a drink, pulled a steak out of the refrigerator, and then something Kathy Brady had said clicked in my head. I fairly ran to the telephone and put in a long-distance call to my old pal, Ham Pratt. Johnny, good to talk to you. Coming out to Lake Mojave for a little fishing? I don't know, Ham. Depends on your answer to a question. Far away, Johnny. Well, this is a real shot in the dark. Have you seen or heard anything of a guy named Charles Foster? Charles Foster? Yeah, Foster. You know anything? Boy, Johnny, your shots in the dark are getting better and luckier all the time. What do you mean? Well, the police from over in Kingman and the sheriff and the coroner seem to think that a guy named Charles Foster has been in some kind of accident or something. But, Johnny, if you ask Just me... Just hold everything, Ham. I'll ask you in person. I'm on my way. Item four, six dollars for a record-breaking taxi ride to Bradley Field. Item five, one hundred and seventy dollars and forty cents for a night flight to Los Angeles. Item six, twenty-one ten for a plane to Las Vegas. There, I got hold of a rental car. The deposit of fifty bucks on it is item seven. Shortly after noon the next day, I was at my favorite fishing spot, Lake Mojave Resort, just above Davis Dam and the Colorado River. But I had other things in mind as I sat in the little office down by the dock and talked with Ham Pratt, the manager of the place. And the authorities have asked Mr. Brady, uh, that was his partner, you know, have asked that Brady stay around a few days just in case. Now, let me get the whole thing straight, Ham. Go right ahead, Johnny. All right, now, Monday, that's three days ago, Brady and Foster hadn't been getting along too well, so each of them went fishing alone. Right. Mr. Foster went up toward the Big Basin. That's about 10, 12 miles up the lake. And Brady said he fished down below near the dam. That's right. Mm -hmm. And nobody has any reason to believe otherwise. Nobody except you. Because of the way young Brady had been behaving, Johnny. You see, I... Well, uh, with all the people I meet running a place like this, well, I I like to think I know a little something about human nature. <laughs> That's the understatement of the week. Well, thank you. Then the wind came up. Yeah. All the rest of the fishermen came back in, including Mike Brady. All but old Mr. Foster. As soon as we dared, after the big blow let up a bit, we sent the launch out looking for him. But all we found was his boat. Where? Beached on the side of the big island. Mm. You know, the one about seven, eight miles up over on the west, the Nevada side. Mm. Could have come from almost anywhere in that much wind, though, Johnny. And there's been no sign of Foster's body. No, sir. All right. Uh, excuse me, Johnny. It sounds like that's for me. Sure. Yes. Oh, hello, Sheriff. I... Oh. Yes, I see. Okay, sir, thank you. Well, Johnny. Yeah? Sheriff says I can tell Mr. Brady it's okay that he can pack up and leave if he wants to. Don't. Oh? Why not? Just don't tell him, Ham. Not yet. You have an idea, Johnny? Let me make a phone call. Then, if it works out the way I hope it will... You got a boat with a good outboard on it that I can borrow? Well, sure. You can take my own with a 40 horse on it. That'll be fast enough for whatever it is you're up to. That'll be fine. But first, let me have that phone. My call was to the weather bureau in Vegas, and they were able to tell me the exact direction of the big wind of three days before. Then, alone, I took off in Ham's outboard and drove some eight or nine miles up the eastern, the Arizona side of the lake. There, for the next few hours, I carefully explored every wash and cove that was a few degrees north of northeast of the big island on the opposite side, the one Ham had mentioned. Luck was with me. The lake was smooth as glass, the water clean. There were a few other boats around in some of the coves, fishermen. I hope I didn't disturb them too much with my prowling. I noticed that one boat kind of followed me as though the man in it hoped I might lead him to a hot fishing spot. They didn't follow me into the cove they call the rock pile, where a lot of huge boulders have fallen from the cliffs above into the deep, clear water. And there I found it. The body of a man, wedged down between two rocks some 15 feet below the surface. 
One foot apparently was tangled in an anchor line. I quickly stripped down to my shorts, dove on over the side. Two hours later, well after dark, I quietly took the body, what was left of it, back to the resort. The body of Charles Foster. the menthol cigarette has tobacco flavor a man can get hold of. Alpine always tastes which never smokes rough. Alpine filter cigarettes. Nice. And, and you don't think we ought to notify the sheriff's office? Not yet, Ham, because we haven't any proof that he was thrown overboard with that anchor tied to his leg. Even the bruises on what's left of him don't really prove anything. Pretty diabolical, Johnny. If you hadn't been carefully looking for him in those coves, I, I mean at that depth and with usually a ripple on the water. I know. That dead calm was the only thing that made it possible. That and a little luck. And if the body had stayed there a while, nobody ever would have found him. But now look, Johnny, if what you told me is true, if all that insurance was set up to go to Brady and the business, well, now listen, you better nail him fast. Proof, Ham. Don't you see, without proof that Brady did it, and with everybody believing his alibi about being down at this end of the lake near the dam, if only there was some way to make him show his hand, something we could do that... Yeah, well... Ham, I got an idea. Believe me, Johnny, better be a good one. Well, now don't tell me how you cooked this yourself, Mr. Pratt. <laughs> Hardly. I just had it sent over from the cafe. There's nothing wrong with it, I hope. <laughs> Can't you tell by the way I'm making a pig of myself? It's fine. Mm. Um, more coffee, Mr. Brady? Yes, thank you. But, um, you've aroused my curiosity. Oh? About what? Just why you asked me here to have breakfast with you. Well, with all you've been through these past few days, it seemed like the least I could do. I appreciate it. Oh, uh... A cigarette? Oh, no, thanks. You go right ahead, though. Thank you. Matter of fact, the reason for all this food is I was half expecting somebody else to join us. Oh? Uh, who? An old friend of mine who pulled in here yesterday afternoon. His name is, uh... Oh, now, maybe that's him now. Come in. Well, I thought you was going to have breakfast with us, too. Damn, I forgot all about it. Sorry. Well, sit down and have a cup of coffee with us anyhow. Why not? Meet Mr. Mike Brady. One of our new customers here. Hi. Mr. Brady, this is Mr. Johnny Harris. Oh? Harris? That's right. Why do you say it that way, Mr. Brady? Oh, I just, uh, thought there was something familiar about your voice, Mr., uh, Harris. I don't believe we've ever met before. No, no. I guess we haven't. Coffee, Johnny? Sure. Well, Johnny, you plan to bring in a string of lunkers today? You're gonna try See, Mr. Dollar is one of our most avid fishermen, Mr. Brady. Uh, Mr. Pratt, wait a minute. Just then you called him... Yeah, I am. I, uh, I thought I'd take a crack at the rock pile this morning. The rock pile, did you say? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Brady. It's a big cove about eight miles up the lake on this side. Lots of rocks fell off a cliff and made a kind of rock pile under the water. Uh, haven't you tried that spot yet? Why, you know that all my fishing has been down at uh, this end of the lake, Mr. Pratt. Oh, yes, yes. I, I guess you did tell me that, didn't you? It happens to be a fact. I'm sure it is. But now, look here. Didn't you introduce this, uh, gentleman as Mr. Harris, Johnny Harris? Oh, well, sure. And yet a moment ago, you... Yeah, began... as I told you, Mr. Brady, Johnny is one of our best visiting fishermen. Mr. Pratt. Uh, but, Johnny, there's no point in your trying the rock pile today. Why not, him? Well, I just got word from the boys at the dam they're going to let out a lot of water. Some emergency or other down at one of the lakes below us here. Let out, uh, let out some of the water? Uh, yes, sir. It'll be low tide today. I'm sorry, Johnny. Oh, so am I. Well, um, how much do they drop the water in this lake, Mr. Pratt? The way I understand it, it may go down as much as 20 feet. 20 feet? What's the matter, Mr. Brady? Why, uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. 
But now, excuse me, gentlemen. I, uh, there are, uh, some things I have to do. Well, now, Mr. Brady, I thought you was going fishing, too, this morning. Yes, yes, I am. Uh, thanks very much for the breakfast. Wait a minute, Brady. Why don't you go out with me? I'd rather go alone, thank you. Oh, well, we could at least try the rock pile until the water gets too low up there. No, excuse me. I'll see you later on. What's the hurry? I tell you I want to go fishing. Oh, no, you don't. I beg your pardon? You want to be sure of getting up to that rock pile before I do. What are you talking about? So that you can move the body of your partner, the man you murdered, out of that cove before somebody else sees it. What are you talking Get it out of there and hide it somewhere else. You're crazy. Because you know it'll be a dead giveaway. No. You know the bruises on it will show how you murdered him, how you tied the anchor line around his leg to make him Listen sick. To get your you. hands on the insurance, half a million dollars worth. Get your hands on the business that he's left behind. Can you deny that, Brady? No. No. No, I can't. Any more than you can deny who you really are. Mr. Johnny Dollar. That's right. Insurance investigator. Right again. Well, it's too bad. It's too bad for you. Too bad that you caught up with me. Do you see this? Now, put away that gun, Mr. Brady. You see, you give me no choice now, Dollar. And I'm sorry, Mr. Pratt, but the same goes for you. Don't be ridiculous, Brady. Ridiculous or smart? Surely you don't think you can get off a shot with that thing before I can draw my own gun. Dollar? Right? For instance, like this. Johnny, that took a lot of nerve. Nerve? Damn, I was scared to death. Uh, what? I guess I'd never qualify for a part on gun smoke. <laughs> Needless to say, Ham's talk about dropping the level of Lake Mojave by a full 20 feet was all a bluff, but it worked. Expense account total, including the trip on back to Hartford. Well, Mr. Benham, I think I'll just forget that in view of my nice, fat commission on that half-million-dollar policy. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, somebody takes a crack at the perfect crime and with pretty exciting results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Musical supervision by Ethel Huber. The role of Johnny Dollar was played by Mandel Kramer. Also heard in our cast were Santos Ortega as Frederick Benham, Terry Keene as Kathy, Bernard Grant as Brady, Bob Dryden as Ham Pratt. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Art Hannah speaking. Hi, this is Arthur Godfrey, and I'll be back on Monday with tales like this one. They sparkle, they bubble, they go to get you in a whole lot of trouble. You're overworking them. There's danger lurking in them. Their eyes, let me hear you go, Richard. On Monday's Arthur Godfrey time with Richard Hayes, Dick Hyman and the orchestra, and yours truly, John Philip Sousa. That's right, Arthur Godfrey, every weekday on these stations of the CBS Radio Network. <laughs>